Hello, brothers and sisters. God bless. Hope your night or day is going good. Here's a video I came across called Christian Perfection Sermon Jam. And I'm going to go ahead and play it through. Then we'll come back and listen to it. We'll line it up with the Word of God and see if what it says makes sense in accordance with the scriptures. So as you're listening through the first time, see if what you hear lines up with the gospel. Jesus said that God would perfect his followers as they simply kept his word. Jesus prayed for his disciples just before he went to the cross. He wanted them to have final assurance before they would see him crucified. Christ clearly says that his disciples are those who heard the gospel message and received it. Jesus' disciples saw and knew that Jesus was the Messiah and gave him their life. These men were separate from the sin of the world. They were consecrated fully to God. Jesus says... Perfection would come as they have kept your word. Perfection is not some mere option in order for a person to go to heaven, but instead it's a prerequisite. Perfection is sanctification, without which no one will see the Lord. Jesus wants his disciples to know that they must continue to keep his word that they must remain fully consecrated to God in order to be saved. He did not want them to despair or lose their faith. He did not want them to become desperate and kill themselves like Judas did. He wanted them to remain with him, remain in him, in faith believing no matter what, no matter what. His high priestly prayer to his Father, in the presence of his disciples. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true. Jesus tells all who have ears to hear, keep my word. Live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Jesus said, only as a person goes on in separated obedience can they go on to perfection. Separated holiness from sin must be revealed in each follower of Christ before we can be where he is. Jesus tells every willing follower that perfection takes place in them after consecration through daily developmental obedience. If you are ever going to please God, you must be separated so that God can be revealed in you. No matter how difficult the road gets, remain separated from every other false hope and stay obedient to Jesus Christ. Endure in this life without spot. Be blameless and may God reveal his son in you. Okay, that was the sermon played through, the short little excerpt, and now we're going to go ahead and break it down as it goes. Jesus said that God would perfect his followers as they simply kept his word. Does he have a chapter and verse for that? Because I can give you a chapter and verse by how we are made perfect, and that's through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. For by one offering Jesus, God has on the cross by one offering, has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So you can see he's already starting off that Perfection is going to come out of self, not out of the offering of the cross of Christ. Otherwise, he would have said that from the very beginning, that we're made perfect by the one offering. 
Jesus prayed for his disciples just before he went to the cross. He wanted them to have final assurance before they would see him crucified. Christ clearly says that his disciples are those who heard the gospel message and received it. Jesus' disciples saw and knew that Jesus was the Messiah and gave him their life. You can see how it kind of did an echoing, gave him their life, 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 life. And it's the way they did the music and the way they're doing it is supposed to bring conviction on the individual who believes on Jesus Christ. And so they would look at, at themselves and say, did I really give Christ my life? Did I really sacrifice my life for Christ? And this terminology that's constantly used is though we're saved because we sacrifice our life for God. When the scripture tells us that we're saved because God sacrificed his life for us. So the idea that, well, you know, have you given up your life for Christ or have you sacrificed your life for Christ is the idea that you're losing out on something. And that's the other thing that Christians need to lose that attitude as though they have lost something by following Christ. They have given something up. They have sacrificed something that their life would have otherwise may have been better in some way. This is completely ridiculous. Jesus said, not only did I come to give life, but I came to give it more abundantly. There's no better life than one can have than one with Jesus Christ. Because the life with Jesus Christ offers peace. It offers joy. It offers reconciliation. It offers the love of God, which never fails in this life, not only in the life to come, but in this life. We um, have access to the Father, God, the ultimacy of reality who provides for all things. We have the name of the Son of God and that we have access to according to God's grace by which we stand that, that no other people do in this reality. So the idea that you're losing something when you come to Christ or you're giving something up or you're sacrificing something when the Bible says, you have been blessed with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. That he that did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not freely with him give us all things? So we don't lose out when we come to Christ. We get life more abundant. Not only did I come to give life, but I came to give it more abundantly. But these people act like they're sacrificing, they're losing out on the big party by coming to Jesus. And it's, it's just that kind of attitude when Jesus, we're saved by him sacrificing his life for us. These men were separate from the sin of the world. They were consecrated fully to God. Jesus says... Now, when Jesus called these men, they were just simple fishermen. Um, you know, one was a, a, a doctor, a physician. One was a tax collector. Um, so when Jesus came and called them by his grace, it wasn't like these men were just like some exceptional men of righteousness under the law in society, it, you know, I mean, in human perspective, it would have been the Jews under the law striving, right? These were just average men that Jesus came to call to himself and to save, you know, and he's just making it like these disciples were sinless perfectionists all of a sudden because they were following Jesus. Perfection would come as they have kept your word. Perfection is not some mere option in order for a person to go to heaven, but instead it's a prerequisite. For and I agree with that. But perfection comes through the offering, right? For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So we're made perfect through the one offering according to the scripture. If you deny that, then you're saying that you're being made perfect through what you do. And the scripture says, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Do you think you're being made perfect in the flesh? That you think that what you're doing by human efforts in the flesh is making you perfect. And it's outside of what Christ did on the cross. Paul said, may I never boast except in the cross of Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So our boasting is in the cross of Christ through which we have been made perfect through that one offering and been crucified to the world once and for all because of what Jesus did. 
and it's not the flesh. We've been crucified to the flesh too. That's why the Bible says you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. But these people believe that they're going to cleanse themselves, as you can see here, cleanse, holiness, purity, and sanctify. They believe this is going to come about on their own efforts and not by the cross. All of these things come about by the cross, cleanse. The Bible says the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that has to do with the blood of Christ. If you've ever come and confessed that you were a sinner, he's cleansed you of all sin and all unrighteousness. And he moved your sins as far as the east is to the west. And it was because of his death on the cross that we were cleansed of our sins. The holiness that was because of the death on the cross by which we have been made holy. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 says, by his will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. So. The sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross has made us holy, according to the scriptures, once and for all. That is, throughout eternity, once and for all, forever, we will be made holy because of the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, not by what we do. Purity, we have purity because we are in Jesus Christ who is pure. The scripture says, beloved, now we are the children of God. And it has not been made known yet what we shall be, but we know that when we shall see him, we shall be made like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has that hope in themselves purifies themselves, even as he is pure. So the very hope that you'll be made like Jesus Christ when you see him purifies you, even as he is pure. It's not your works. It's not how hard you try. It's not your strivings under the law. But in the very hope that you'll be made like him. He that has this hope in themselves purifies themselves, even as he is pure. It's just like our faith. Our faith is the same way. It makes us righteous. It's not by what we do under the law. Paul said, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness came through the law, then Christ died needlessly. It's our faith in Jesus Christ that makes us righteous. May I be found in him having a righteousness not of my own, which comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, even the righteousness of God on the basis of faith. Perfection is sanctification, without which no one will see the Lord. So you can see he said perfection is sanctification. Well, is he saying that he's sanctified or he's getting sanctification outside of Jesus Christ? That he's going to boast in, in his flesh by means of human effort? Because the scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30, by his own doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became from us from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and wisdom, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. So my boasting for my sanctification is that Jesus Christ has done it for me, and I am in him where I now have received it. By his own doing, you are in Christ Jesus, by God's doing, by his own doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became from us from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and wisdom. So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. If you deny that Jesus Christ is your sanctification, then you believe that you're attaining it by means of human effort in the flesh, and you're taking on the boasting outside of Christ and saying that you're doing it. And so that's what this leads to ultimately when you say that Christ isn't your sanctification, you're saying that I'm going to do it, that you're doing it on your own human effort. We'll play it back. Real quick here and listen to it again. Person to go to heaven, but instead it's a prerequisite. Perfection is sanctification, without which no one will see the Lord. Jesus. See, so he said it's a prerequisite sanctification, and he's laying this out as though it's dependent upon your own obedience to perform this for you to be saved. That you won't get into heaven. That is, it's a prerequisite to get into heaven. You won't get into heaven unless you have this. Well, you have it in Jesus Christ. And if you deny that you have it in Jesus Christ, you believe that you're getting saved upon your own works and performance and attaining something that Jesus Christ apparently didn't. And so you believe that you're putting the icing on the cake of salvation and denying that Jesus actually did it. Now, that's what happens when you don't boast that Jesus Christ is your sanctification. Jesus wants 
wants his disciples to know that they must continue to keep his word, that they must remain fully consecrated to God in order to be saved. He did not want them to despair or lose their faith. He did not want them to become desperate and kill themselves like Judas did. He wanted them to remain with him, remain in him, in faith, believing, no matter what. No so he's seeing there that he's acting as though Jesus is worried that they're going to lose their faith. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus didn't pray for people's faith. He prayed for Peter's faith. He said, Peter, I prayed for you that your faith may not fail you. So Jesus prayed that his faith wouldn't fail, and we know that it didn't fail. And he prays that prayer for all of us. Father, I pray not for the world, but those whom you've given me out of the world, for they are yours. And he prayed that we would not be touched by the evil one. And he prays that we will be kept till the end. And so he's the author and finisher of our faith. That's what it says about Jesus, looking unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. He starts our faith, and he finishes it. He that began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he that began a good work in you will perfect it all the way until the end. That is, you're not going to lose your faith because he began it. He's the author and finisher of it. It's not to say that you can't have difficult times or doubt or worries concerning your faith. But ultimately, it's a gift of God that you can never lose. The Bible says by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is a gift of God and not of works, least any man should post. So faith is not from yourself, it is a gift of God. And the Bible says the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. So the calling on your, God, on your life is irrevocable. And the gift of faith that God has given you, the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. God won't take it away. You're not going to lose it. You may struggle, you may have difficulty, you may have trouble. But you'll always have peace in Jesus Christ who keeps you in his hand. And he, by the power of God, you're kept through faith. So my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives to I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The faith that he has given you is not as the world gives does he give to you. Um, and it's a peace that you can have that's everlasting because God is the one that keeps you. And he's given you the very gift that has saved you. Prayer to his father in the presence of his disciples. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is true. Jesus tells all who have ears to hear, keep my word. Well, to some people that means gouge out your eyes and cut off your hands, sell all you own. Because they don't understand what Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 when he was talking about the functionality of the law. And so they... If you don't understand what Jesus is saying, and if you just blindly say, well, I'm going to just obey Jesus and what he said, and I, and you, you might actually not be in obeying him at all. You may be misunderstanding what he is saying and then trying to justify yourself under the works of the law, which is in part what seems like what's going on here. So when the disciples were asked, what must we do to be saved? They didn't say, well, keep his word and be real vague with it. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your whole household. So you can always see this subtle shift away from believing, having trust and confidence and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ into trusting in yourself. In fact, it seems like throughout this whole thing, it's not even mentioned that, that we believe unto the saving of the soul and that's how we're saved by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and made righteous and made right with God and reconciled unto him. For all time but it's always the spotlight is back on the person as though they're being made perfect in the flesh by human efforts which was the Galatian heresy they thought they were being made f perfect in the flesh are you so foolish having begun in the spirit do you think you're being made perfect in the flesh through human effort live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God yeah see live by every word that comes forth out of the mouth of God. Well, Jesus said to cut off your hands and gouge out your eyes. That's how we that's how we live by those Jesus said to do these things, so we better do the law, right? We better keep the law now. But the scripture says we live by faith, and the law is not of faith. When Paul said, May I be found in him having a righteousness not of my own, which comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, even the righteousness of God on the basis of faith. 
Paul didn't say that living by faith was living by the law. He said the opposite. So the scripture is very clear that we walk by faith. And if you're going back to the law, you're not walking by faith anymore. Otherwise, Paul wouldn't have, wouldn't have said, may I be found in him having a righteousness not of my own, which comes through the law, but that which comes through faith in Jesus Christ, even the righteousness of God on the basis of faith. We know that Paul was walking by faith. And when he walked by faith, he didn't look to his performance under the law to find out if he was reconciled, made righteous, or made justified with God, but he looked to the cross of Jesus Christ. May I never boast except in the cross of Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It's that one offering by which he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. So when he's talking to the Galatians and says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you through whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly betrayed as crucified, this one thing I want to know from you, did you receive the Spirit by the keeping of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, do you think you're being made perfect in the flesh? He's reminding them about Jesus Christ being crucified, that one offering by which he had perfected for all time, but yet they are foolish enough to believe that they're being made perfect in the flesh. And that's the problem with a lot of modern day pop culture Christianity. They look away from Christ, his blood and his work, to look to themselves as though they are the ones saving themselves. Again, they are putting the icing on the cake of salvation. They believe they're adding to what Jesus Christ did and making it better. Jesus said only as a person goes on in separated obedience can they go on to perfection. Separate so you can see there, he says, unless a person goes on in separate obedience, can, they won't have perfection. So he's saying it's through your obedience that you're going to have perfection. But the gospel tells us that just as through one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, even so through the one man's obedience, many are made righteous. So it's through the one man's obedience that we're made righteous. Through Jesus Christ's obedience, we're made righteous, not through our collective efforts and striving under the law to establish our own, but what Jesus did, we are made righteous. So if you deny that you're made righteous and you're made perfect through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all, then you believe that you're going to do it on your own efforts and you're operating from a position of self-righteousness and you believe that you're going to obtain these things all from self. Not that Jesus did it, but you're going to do it. I'm going to play that back again real quick. Jesus said only as a person goes on in separated obedience can they go on to perfection. And by the way, this guy did it again where he's saying things that Jesus didn't say. Did Jesus say that? Could I have the chapter and verse for that? Because Jesus didn't say that. He did in John chapter 6, verse 47. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me has, not might have, not could have, not possibly have, but has eternal life. And it's upon believing, not through your performance and your own obedience, but it's through the one man's obedience we're made righteous. So you can see how he's denying that. See, this is a separate holiness from sin. Well, we have that in Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 says, By his will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. We are separate in him. We know the Son of God has appeared to take away our sin, and in him there is no sin. So if you're in Jesus Christ, you are separate from sin. See, he's acting like you're not separate from sin where you're at right now in Christ Jesus. But if you have the righteousness of Christ on the basis of faith, and in him there is no sin, you are separate from sin, and you have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Once and for all, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10, by his will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. If you deny that you were made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe that you're going to do it under your own power in the flesh and human effort, and you're taking the glory upon yourself and not giving glory to God in the sacrifice by which that actually happened. See, that's the, the, the danger and the blasphemy of this teaching here. Separated holiness from sin, 
must be revealed in each follower of Christ before we can be where he is. See, your obedience must take place before you can be where he is. That's what he basically just said in the collection of all that he just said. That your obedience must take place first before you can be where he is. And yet, you are right now where he is if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and he is right now where you are. First uh, John says, he that believes in the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So Jesus Christ is in you right now. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. And the scripture says he will never leave you or forsake you. So the idea that you have to make yourself righteous on your own power and standing through your own obedience before you can be with him is not what the scripture teaches at all. He teaches that he comes to the ungodly and the sinner and reconciles that sinner unto himself. If while we are enemies, we are reconciled to God through the death of his son, how much more having now been reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? So we were reconciled even as enemies, not when we got obedient and we cleaned ourselves up, made ourselves righteous, then we could be with him. But Christ made the way possible through, the, through his body that we could be with him. And he cleaned us up and he made us righteous through his blood so that we could be with him and he with us. And he's with us right now. The scripture says he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, and we are in Christ right now. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. We have been positionally placed in Christ, where he's become our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption, our wisdom. He's become all things to us unto God, and the denial of that leads to the idea that you're going to do something that Jesus didn't. Jesus tells every willing follower that perfection takes place in them after consecration through daily developmental obedience. If you See, he doesn't believe that it's by that one offering that he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. He believes he's being made perfect through his daily obedience in the flesh. And yet the scripture is so clear. Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Do you think you're being made perfect in the flesh? So this is a very important part. So I'm going to play it again because notice, notice it's going to get to this part too. Or if you are ever pleasing to God, so we'll get to this. Let me play it through now. Jesus tells every willing follower that perfection takes place in them after consecration through daily developmental obedience if you are ever going to please god you must notice what he said if you're ever going to please god he's suggesting that you as a believer aren't pleasing to god right now and yet the scripture says without faith it is impossible to please god and the object of our faith is in jesus christ who is pleasing to god remember the father said this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased so if you're in Christ Jesus, you're well-pleasing to the Father on the basis of faith by which you're placed into Christ. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. See, he's got this, if you're ever going to please God, he's suggesting again that your faith in Christ Jesus isn't pleasing to God. There's something that you're going to have to do, and that's going to be your works and performance in the flesh. And yet the Bible says those in the flesh cannot please God. Are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Do you think you're being made perfect in the flesh? It was that one offering. By one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Faith and trust and confidence in the Lord Jesus Christ and his cross, by which we know that we have been made perfect for all time. And we know that we're pleasing to God on the basis of faith because Jesus Christ was perfectly pleasing to the Father in his life, in his death, by which we are placing our faith in and not our life. See, this is about placing faith in your life when, you know, you can see that's what he's saying. It's about placing faith in your life. And if you want to be pleasing to God, you have to be made perfect in the flesh by doing something. And I'm going to be very vague on it. So I'm just going to say obey his word. That's basically what he's saying. Obey his word. You know, well, when Jesus' disciples were asked, what must we do to do the works of God? Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe in the one that he sent. So they thought there was a myriad of things and works that they had to do to be pleasing to God, that there was a bunch of works that they had to do 
but faith and belief is what's pleasing to God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And Jesus said, this is the work of God, one singular thing that you believe in the one that he sent. And that's pleasing to God because you're having faith in the one in whom God is well pleased. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of the things not seen. So our faith contains all the substance that we need for salvation, evidence of the things not seen. These people are constantly looking to their life for evidence of whether or not their faith is legitimate by the things that they see. Well, I'm, I'm obedient, I'm righteous in and of my own standing. I can see that I'm keeping the law now or whatever it is going on in their mind outside of the cross of Christ by which they believe they're ultimately being saved. They believe they're adding something to the cross of Christ, some good work, some, some striving under the law, something they believe, some obeying his teachings in some particular way, something that they're doing, but by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourself, it is a gift of God. So salvation is not of ourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. If you're going to please God, you must be separated so that God can be revealed in you. No matter. So you see it, be separate so that God can be revealed in you. So he's saying once you have your own obedience and your own personal righteousness, then God can be revealed in you. But if you believe in Jesus Christ, he's revealed in you right now. In 1 John it says, whoever believes in the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So according to the scriptures, if you believe, he's abiding in you right now. He that believes in the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. According to the scriptures, unless he was abiding in you, the Spirit of God, you wouldn't be able to make the confession unto salvation. Paul said, Beloved, this one thing I want to make known to you, no one speaking of the Spirit of God can say Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So to be able to say that Jesus Christ is Lord, you need the Holy Spirit. No one can say Jesus Christ is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And so if you're confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord by the Holy Spirit, the scripture says, In whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. So you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise all the way until the day of redemption. Christ isn't going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He's already revealed himself to you. The fact that you believe in him is a sign of it. First John says, whoever believes in the Son of God has the witness in themselves. So if you believe in the Son of God, he, the witness is in you, testifying of the work and the life of Christ. You have the witness in yourself. How difficult the road gets. Remain separated from every other false hope and stay obedient to Jesus Christ. Endure in this. Stay obedient to Jesus Christ. The Bible says you are obedient from the heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. So we were obedient from the heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered to us. The scripture says with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you were made righteous. And when you confess that he was Lord, you were saved with what the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So you know when you believed and you made the confession, you were saved, not after you did a bunch of good works of righteousness, but then you could look to your own obedience and know you were saved. We look to the obedience of Jesus Christ. That's how we know we are saved. Without spot, be blameless. You know that it says be blameless. You know, to be holy is to be blameless, and to be blameless is to be holy. And we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. That's what Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 says again. It says it all the time. Every time I open up the Bible, by his will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. So it's God who does these things. The scripture says, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your body, soul, and spirit be preserved blameless. At the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, faithful is he who calls, and he will also bring it to pass. So it's the God of peace who sanctifies us entirely, body, soul, and spirit. And he preserves them complete and blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls, and he will also bring it to pass. So it's God who brings to pass what we cannot. He's the one that brings these things to pass. Um, the scripture says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you appear blameless before him, 
with great joy. So it's God who keeps us from stumbling in our faith towards him. It's him that keeps us from stumbling, not us, that we may appear before him blameless with great joy. So it's God who makes us appear before him blameless with great joy. That was God's intention. When uh, Paul wrote to us, he said, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings and the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption, according to the kind intention of his will. So we have been made holy and blameless before him through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ once and for all. It's what God called us to, and it was according to his kind intention and his will. He saved us and called us with a holy calling, not because of our own works, but because of his own purposes of grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So God saved us and called us with the holy calling, not because of our own works. We're not made holy because of our own works. We're made holy through what Jesus did and the purposes of grace in Jesus. He saved us and called us with the holy calling, not because of our own works, but because of his own purposes of grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. So before we were even alive and did anything, it was God's intention to make us holy through the sacrifice of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it wasn't through our works. It was through his grace. And may God reveal his Son in you. See, this is a thing to believers, and may God reveal his Son into you, but if whoever believes in the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. That Your believing, your faith is the sign of God in you. And, you know, these people want to place their faith in something else other than the cross of Christ. You can see the temptation in them. You know, some obedience of mind that's going to save me and make me righteous, make me justified and reconciled unto God. You know, I'll sacrifice my life and give it to Jesus. <laughs> you know, he sacrificed his life and he gave us all things. He that did not spare his son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not freely with him give us all things? So don't act like you're losing out because you gave your life up for Christ. He gave us all things. He blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. And we're blessed here on this earth um, with peace, with reconciliation, with justification, with God's righteousness, uh, with his name that we can call upon at any time, any moment. We can always approach the throne of grace boldly in a time of need because of God and his revealing of his son to us. And the love of God, which surpasses all understanding, not only in the life to come, but this life right now. We're told to comprehend the love of God, which surpasses all knowledge and wisdom and understanding. So God bless, guys. Peace to you. Take care, and I hope your day is going good. God bless you.